so the recording is starting now. Okay, and uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so we, I'm going to start with question six, uh, sorry, question five in the exercises. And here we're looking at the uh, projection of the curve. So here I'm looking at the co complex exponential curve and the, the equation of the curve is five e to the t cos three t plus j sine t so this is question five and uh when when you want to talk about the project the uh the in if the projection on the imaginary t plane basically we're going to set the real value to zero so real equals zero looking only at the complex uh, plane and then the signal is going to be just uh this part over here which is five e to the t j five e to the t sine three t sine three t and uh so this is a sinusoid okay and that's going to be three by uh, three by two pi hertz there we go all right and since i'm as confused about this as can be i can, I can promise you there will not be a question on this because i can't solve it myself uh i really am an assistance person and uh, this this two pi factor always throws me off uh, anyway thank you douglas that was very helpful all right, um, it's a good thing I, would be, uh, I can have help from you. Okay, so let's look at the next one then, uh, which is the linearity. So here, what you're trying to do is something like this. We want to sort of say the H is sort of the fake transfer function. It's not really a function, transfer function, which is Y is H of X. And we want to look at H of K1, X1 plus K2, X2. And this you're going to say, is this the same as that's a question mark over there. This is the same as h of uh, k1 uh, or k1 h of x1 plus k2 h of x2. So that would be sort of the linearity property plus k2 h of x2. Is that true or not? And if you just expand it, what's, what you're going to get is on the on the left hand side, we're going to look at essentially uh, this function over here is. Uh, five uh, sort of k1 dx1 by dt uh, plus one and then plus k2 dx2 by dt plus one and on the right hand side uh, sorry the, the, so this is the this is the uh, this one over here and on the left hand side it's going to be so you get this plus one twice on the right hand side, on the, on the left hand side, you get plus one only once, so they don't match up. And so it, it turns out to be not, not linear. So, uh, so it's basically h of x1 is five, uh, k1 dx1 by dt plus one, and k2 times h2, hx is just k2 dx2 by dt plus one, and that's, that's, okay, you know what, I am messing this up, sorry. So, Let's do this properly. Um, trying to, okay, so uh, the right hand says K1 HX1 is 5 K1 DX1 DT plus 1, and K2 uh, H of X2 is uh, uh, and today is not a good day. Okay, let's start here. Um, so this is, let's do this, this is K1 times five uh, dx1 by dt plus one plus K2 five dx2 by dt plus one. That's what the right hand side is. And the left hand side is uh, uh, five, D of uh, K1 X1 plus K2 X2 DT plus one. Okay. And so, you're, so the left, the right hand side expands to five D X1 the DT plus five K1 plus K1 plus 5k2 dx2 by dt 
equals k2, right? And then the left-hand side, we have uh, five, uh, the, the, we expand this over here, k1 dx1 by dt plus uh, k2 dx2 by dt plus one. And uh, and this one turns out to be k1 dx1 by k dx1 by dt. Sorry about that. Plus um, right, and you can see the the basically those sides don't match. It's not equal to this, and so it turns out to be not linear. So it, it's a matter of expanding it uh, both sides carefully. Okay, any any questions over that? Okay, let me move on then to the next one. So what's the output of an LTI system when the input is a real sinusoid? So to, to study this, basically we should use, we, we, we can view a, a, a real sinusoid. So we know that sine theta is going to be uh, can be written in the form of an exponential. So one over two J uh, e to the theta minus, uh, sorry, e to the J theta minus e to the minus J theta. So this is the, from all this formula, we get uh, this one over here. So it's, just, it's it, it, so it's sort of two exponentials, e to the J theta by two J minus e to the minus J theta by two J. And this is a complex exponential, and it's a complex exponential. So when you give a complex exponential into an LTI system, we're going to get out a complex exponential uh, from it as well. Uh, that's what the LTI system does. It uh, results in uh, essentially scaling up uh, the uh, complex exponential. Now, uh, and, and that's because we, as we, as, as we looked at over here, uh, when the input is uh, some complex exponential e to the st, then the output is going to be f of s e to the st, where at this is some function of s, not function of t. s and not t. And so when we look at this, what we're going to get is that this, uh, uh, this term and this term each get multiplied uh, by uh, a value uh, of f of s. And uh, since it's independent of t, we're going to end up with essentially a, a, a scaled real sinusoid. We're going to end up with a scaled real sinusoid. We're going to end up with a scaled real sinusoid. Now, f of s could have some value. It'll be some, uh, for each value of s, it'll be some value of a plus b, j, b. So it's going to have some real and some uh, imaginary component. Now the real component will result in this, uh, the scaling of the sinusoid over uh, uh, with, with some value of s, not with respect to time, but with respect to s. And then this j, b will result in actually a phase shift, possibly. So the output is going to be a scaled and phase shifted version of the input, and uh, but but the but the frequency is not going to change because we could the function as a function of time we don't change things. So we have a scaled and phase shifted sinusoid. Sorry. Uh, okay, so. Any, any questions on that? Yeah, can I just ask how specifically you define a sinusoid? Well, a sinusoid is, a, well, so basically cos theta is a sinusoid and sine theta. So, you know, essentially sinusoid is something that varies, you know, uh, as, a, as a function of cos theta. Uh, I mean, it's nothing complex. Well, it's, it's, it's just a function of time, which is, uh, yeah. Cos theta, cos theta t to be more precise. It's a function of time. Okay. 
Um, why will the output be a real sinusoid necessarily? Uh, right, we... right. Yeah, so if you get sort of equal and opposite uh, values over here in the complex, then they cancel. Then the then the uh, values cancel out basically in the, uh, in the in the imaginary plane, and you get just the real. So uh, more precisely, we 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 have over here a real value coming going in, right? Hmm. And so, and we expand it in this way. So each of these is going to get multiplied by some value uh, f s. Uh, and uh, so intuitively what you're seeing, what you, can, what, you can, what you can see over here is that if you want to get something that is not real, that is something imaginary, then you're going to have to have different uh, multipliers to this term and th for the, the term on the left and the term on the right, right? Otherwise you, you, they're just going to cancel each other out. <laughs> Um, right, but uh, what if like the exponential with j theta, that exponent gets multiplied by say c1 and the other one, the one with minus j theta gets uh, multiplied by c2 when going yes. through the linear system, then they won't cancel out, will they? That's correct. If that, that, that's true. So if the, the, the so here is appealing to <coughs> the heuristics to say that, uh, sorry, intuition, intuition to say that um, these are going to be the same. Um, the, I mean, the, the more formal way of showing that is to take this function over here and put it into the, uh, uh, into the LTI system and show that when you have the time invariance. Uh, and, and so if you follow the steps of the derivation, what you'll find is that the, you, you, you don't actually have separate uh, uh, co coefficients. Wouldn't, okay, thank you. Wouldn't just taking a first derivative be a linear system that gives different coefficients? Uh, let's see. Okay. Because the, it wouldn't affect it wouldn't affect the first. Well, it would multiply the first term by j and the second term by minus j. Um, you're going. To, okay, so you're saying if you take the first derivative, yeah, if you, the the if you have a complex conjugates multiplying the values, then you're still going to end up with a, a real, uh, with a real sinusoid. Um, I'm trying to see- Oh yes, because it's allowed to be a cosine wave instead. That's right, yeah, it could be a cosine wave. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. So the, the intuition here, maybe I can <clears throat> make, it, sorry, I'm just getting a cough here. Um, the, the intuition here is that if you take a real physical system, and this is important to understand, and you give it a real input, you're not going to get a complex output, right? So in some sense, the complex space is, is it, that's why it's called imaginary. It's, it's, you know, when we have a real system with a real sinus, you get a real output. And so if you have a real system, this LTI system, and you're giving it over here uh, a, a potentially complex input, but we know that it's a real sinus going in, what you're going to get out is a real sinus coming out. So that's the other way of looking at it. We're not going to create anything out of, uh, from from whole cloth, as it were. Okay, but but I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm here uh, using intuitive argument, but <clears throat> the, uh, a more formal argument, uh, you'd have to work it out. And uh, yeah, but in, in fact, that's what you're getting. At. Uh, sorry. So does that mean that in general, if you have a signal that is a sum of a complex and presidential, which are complex conjugates of each other, uh -huh. and you put it through a LTI, the mm -hmm. coefficients will cancel each other out, either in the real or imaginary part. The, the, uh, that's right. So if you're going to put in, uh, I mean, if you have an LTI system, again, if the LTI system is modeling a real system, you can only put in a real sinusoid into it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it'll have complex conjugate uh, coefficients if you want for it to be a, a real. System and then the, and the LTI system will also cancel out the complex conjugates. Okay, so this is it's not so this will be the case in any general uh, in, in, in any general system in any real system when we compute the uh, values of the uh, uh, you know the natural response for example right of a real system then the natural, the natural response uh, will have complex conjugate values if it's on the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have an oscillatory response, you'll have complex conjugate 
values, which means that if your j equals zero on the, uh, so if you have a complete, if you have any kind of response, so we'll, we'll look at it in just a moment, actually. I'll, when you do the next question, I think you'll see the natural response and you'll see that you'll get complex conjugates again. Uh, so let, let me move on to the next one. And then I think that perhaps it'll become a bit clearer uh, over here. So here we're looking at the uh, natural response. So the, the, the system can be, is, uh, is can be, can be expressed uh, sort of using the, using the notation, the del, uh, the, the operator notation is 2D squared plus 11D plus 15 uh, YT. And then this turns out to be factor, factorizable as two times d plus three, uh, d plus 2.5 yt. Okay, and then basically if you look at this, this, looks, this gives you two, uh, uh, response, two steps. So basically this becomes uh, e to the minus three t, and there's some multiplied with some constant, plus c2, e to the minus 2.5t. And then to find these values, you have to look at basically y, y is zero and y dot is zero, and that will give you the values of this, of what the constants are over here. Uh, okay, so that's, right. And actually the next one is the one where you get, where, where we, when we compute these constants, you'll see how they work out. But and, any questions about this? Over here, and, and here we see the the fact that um, when we when we have this kind of system over here, these uh, this value over here, this value over here, are the exponentials, uh, complex exponentials, potentially complex exponentials that are being created. Uh, in this case, they are they are uh, real valued exponentials. Uh, we don't know what the constants are, but these are real valued exponentials that we have. And they, we're getting it out because each mode is being sort of uh, separately uh, amplified or by the uh, by the underlying LTX system. That's one way to think about it. Okay. Uh, any any questions about that? Okay, so moving on uh, to the nine, nine over here. So here we want to look at the exact natural response, which means you need to determine the coefficients as well. And, and the equation is given by uh, 2d squared plus one equals zero. And we're also given two other things, which is uh, uh, y, we're given that y of uh, zero uh, equals zero and y dot of zero equals one. So, so we want to know the, we want to further frequency and then eventually you want to know the stability, uh, stability of it as well. Okay, so to uh, compute this, so first we're going to factorize this one over here and uh, the way to factorize it is basically 2d square is minus one. And so d squared equals uh, minus one over two or d equals plus minus uh, j over root two. So the terms are going to be uh, d minus j over root two and uh, d plus j over root two. Okay, so that's just basically the factorization. So then we get two exponentials from it, which will be c1 uh, corresponding to the first one, it's going to be, uh, so, so, well, let me just do this plus and minus because that's the way I have it in my notes. Um, right, so this gives me C1 uh, e to the minus j uh, t by square root two plus C2 e to the minus, sorry, e to the plus j t by square root two. So, and that's going to be what yt is. Okay. And, uh, and so now we need to know what c1 and c2 are. So to set that first, we said y of zero equals zero and that reduces. So when you set t to zero, this term uh, becomes, uh, this term becomes one, this term becomes one. And so we get the equation uh, C1 plus C2 equals zero. 
And then the other one is y dot of zero equals one. And then if you want to, if we, if we expand that, we get uh, minus j over root two c one plus j over root two c two equals one. And, uh, and we can rewrite this as just uh, uh, C1 minus C2. So it actually, let me do the steps because it's, I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. So, uh, so this is going to be minus J over square root two, C1. Uh, minus C2 equals one. And uh, so we, okay, so, and, and if you multiply throughout by uh, J, uh, this becomes uh, one, if you multiply by J, uh, and then this becomes J. And so we get uh, C1 minus C2 equals root two, uh, root two J. And now we know that C1, uh, equals minus C2. And so we get minus two, C2 equals root two J and C2 equals uh, minus J over root two. And then C1 is going to be J over root two. And again, we see over here the complex conjugate uh, value. So these are complex conjugates of each other, which is what I was explaining earlier. We, this is how we're getting, uh, we're getting those uh, values over here. As typically we'll see those kind of uh, conjugate, complex conjugate values. And, and the, the frequency of this, so again, going back to this, this is going to be uh, one over root two, the frequency is one over root two radians per second. Let's just keep it as radians per second. Uh, okay. Any, any questions about this? Um, I had a question about a related example in the notes. Yeah. Uh, example 5.8. Okay. Uh, if you Let go to start. that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna come up to 5.8. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, in that, in the second paragraph, it says for the solution to be real and then it... Yeah. Uh, why are we enforcing that the solution should be real? Yeah, again, because uh, in, I, I'm talking... Uh, I'm not saying the solution should be real. If it's a real system, <clears throat> then you need to have no imaginary components. So it's not like... So if, you, if you're talking about a, <clears throat> an actual physical system, Indeed, you will have no uh, virtual real components. So that's why we need to have complex conjugate. Right, so, but uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Go ahead, please. No, no. So I'm not. So the 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 phrase for the solution to be for the system to be real, I guess what I said for the solution to be real, they have to have no imaginary components. So that's what we mean by saying that. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm sorry, but go ahead. What's your question? Uh, so I wanted to say that we're not enforcing uh, it to be real, right? We're just saying if it were to be real, then That's this right. should hold. That's correct. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So maybe the phrasing is not the best, but uh, the intent is to say that if we, if we want it to be real, we'd like to have that happen. Right. right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, now to find the stability, what we need to do is to basically plug in C1 and C2, as we said, uh, as we want to do over here, because we have over here the values that we, uh, this is the values here. So if you plug in those values of C1 and C2, uh, let me see if I can shrink this, I can put both together. So we're going to get uh, minus J over square root two, e to the minus j t by square root two, and then plus, sorry, uh, blah, this is the wrong one. This is the plus one over here. So it's j over square root two e, e to the minus, uh, let me see if I do this properly. So uh, c1 is j over square root two, so I'm putting it over here, and then plus, uh, let's see, it's minus, minus, uh, j over square root two e to the uh, j by jt by square root two. 
Uh, and uh, this can be viewed as uh, negative of uh, j over square root two uh, e to the uh, j t by square root two minus e to the minus j t by square root two. Right, I'm just uh, moving just moving this term here and this term over there, and and this is basically a, a it's a it is a this is a sine sorry uh sine uh one over square root two sine t over square root two uh, or rather i should say this is going to be two j square sine t over square root two Right, because we, we know that this divided by 2j is sine theta square root 2. And then if you multiply this out, it's going to be 2 over, uh, so these 2j's and the negative cancel out, it becomes 2 over square root 2, which is just um, square root 2 sine t over square root 2. So that's what you get over here as the result. And that's basically a sinusoid. We, we know the frequency already, it's j over square, uh, one over square root two. And that's a, it's a, that's a real sinusoid. And since it's a real sinusoid, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's what's called marginally stable. It's neither stable nor unstable. If it were multiplied by an exponentially declining value e to the something minus alpha t, for example, then that would be declining with time. Uh, and if it were, you know, e to the plus alpha t be increasing with time, but here we have a constant. So this is what's called uh, a marginally stable system. It just oscillates. Okay, uh, any question? All right. Okay, so let's move on to the next one then. Um, so here we want to compute the Fourier series uh, term, or the kth term of a Fourier series for this infinite series of isosceles triangles of base with two pi, height one, space t zero. And then I'm giving you a little fact. So let me work it out. And uh, Okay, I, I just, it, it's a bit of math, but not terribly difficult. Uh, and at least here, I, <laughs> I'm not going to get stuck up, confused with the angular, angular uh, frequencies. Okay, so first we, let me just draw the fig figure over here. And uh, this is what it looks like. So it goes from minus tau to plus tau. And uh, then this, it's sort of, this is, a t, we, you know, t naught is out there somewhere, but we can ignore it for now. And this is zero and the equation over here is one plus t and the equation here is one minus t. And that's a, that's what a triangular pulse looks like. And it's in some range minus t zero over two to t zero over two. Okay, and it repeats every 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 t zero it repeats over here. Okay, so any questions about that? So that's just the, so the, the kth, uh, uh, value is just straight from the definition one over t naught integral minus t naught over two to t naught over two. So over the range of the uh, over this range from here to here, uh, x t uh, e to the minus j k omega naught t. So that's uh, d t. So that's your kind of straight for the definition. Now, if you look at this carefully. Um, <clears throat> the function is going to be uh, one plus t in the range minus tau to zero. And then it's going to be uh, one minus t in the range zero to tau and elsewhere it's it's zero. And of course the limits are from minus t over to t over two, so that's what you care about. And so we can just uh, plug it in. And if you plug it in, we get this. Will, yeah. will it not be one minus um, t over tau? One minus t over tau. Tau, the function over here, you mean? It, it's uh, a, well, for the right hand side, I guess. Um, so that it hits the axis at tau. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Whoops. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I should. We should be careful here. 
Uh, right, in, in both of them, actually, it's not just here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we do need to take that into account. Yeah, we need to make sure that at time tau, we get to zero. So it's going to be one minus T over tau, sorry. And this one is going to be one plus T over tau, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, that's correct. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, if you go back to the equation, we're going to plug this in. And so we get, uh, let's, so we get one over T naught. And then uh, this one over here is going to be integral uh, minus tau to zero. And then the function over here is uh, one plus t over tau e to the uh, oh yeah i'm just going to let me just define something over here so i'm just going to say a equals j k omega naught because i don't want to keep writing it and that's just that's just a convenient thing over here and i'll call that e to the a t dt uh, plus and here's the other uh, integral it's zero to tau one minus t over tau e to the a t dt and that's that's the that's the function we have over here so we just need to compute these two integrals over here and so uh, well when we look at the so <clears throat> when you look at the first one <clears throat> um, it can we can sort of expand this is going to be integral minus tau to zero and we're just taking sort of this term and this term so we get e to the a t dt plus um, one over tau integral zero sorry minus tau to zero uh, it's going to be uh, t e to the a t dt right and then let's just expand it on the next line one over t zero the third one is going to be similarly expanded. Uh, so this is integral zero to tau e to the a t dt minus one over tau integral zero to tau. Um, uh, t e to the a t dt, right? And now essentially it comes down to plugging in these values uh, for each of those integrals. Uh, and uh, we, we, can, uh, we can simplify things a little bit by noticing that uh, this term is e to the at dt and this e to the dt because it's zero to tau minus tau to zero, zero to tau. So it's the same, these two can combine to give you uh, one over t naught uh, integral minus tau to tau e to the a t dt plus uh, one over uh, tau, uh, sorry, tau t naught. I'm just going to combine those over here. Uh, integral uh, minus tau to zero t e to the a t dt plus integral is equal to, sorry, minus, minus integral zero to tau, uh, t e to the a t dt. Okay, I think I did that right. And then let's, uh, this, these integrals are all exponentials and it's uh, very straightforward to integrate those. So the first step, first one is going to be one over t naught, uh, and it's a one over a t. Sorry, one over a, and <clears throat> e to the a t, evaluated at tau and minus tau, plus one over tau t naught. Um, and then for this one here, uh, we know that it's going to look like uh, uh, a t e to the a t minus e to the a t over a squared. And this integral, uh, okay, I sort of, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a step here, it looks like. Um, 
particularly uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry so it's uh, a key a key it remains a key with area over a square integral that evaluated at zero and minus star minus star and uh, plus uh, so uh, I should say minus minus a t to the a t minus e to the a t over a square integrated at tau and zero, and that's inside that brace over here. And uh, and then it, it basically at this point we're just uh, plugging in the values, and we get a one over a t naught. Uh, and this this these terms are just going to reduce. It just becomes uh, e to the a tau minus e to the minus a tau. That's that term uh, plus one over tau t naught. And then we basically have to pl uh, plug in these values over here. And I'll just write the solution as I worked it out. Uh, a minus one over a square t naught. So a square, oops, I already have the t naught over there. Minus one over a square. Um, Um, I'm sorry. So it's going to be e to the minus a tau minus one by a plus tau e to the minus a tau minus to the a tau minus one by a minus tau e to the a tau. And, and then that can be simplified further, but I'm not going to do that. I think we can leave it at that. But the point, the point here is to basically work through the, once you get to this stage over here, uh, writing out the integral in this form, the rest of it is just you know, essentially computing the integrals uh, carefully. Okay, uh, any, any questions about that? So your answer should look roughly like that. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, when it does come to um, how we leave the answers, yes. um, would you want to credit people for simplifying it or would you be happy with something that's got quite a few terms involved, but you've technically integrated it? Yeah. yeah, good point. So I'm mostly looking for understanding rather than, you know, getting everything just right to the minimum possible state. So if you, if, if you show the I mean, if you get, I just want to know that you understand how to evaluate a pulse, what to write the equation down for. And once you have this equation over here, uh, or, or even something that looks slightly messy, that's okay. I, I'm not really uh, hung up about that. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the next one then. Uh, okay. So this is, what's the third coefficient to the Fourier series representing a periodic rectangular pulse with a width of one second, space about 10 seconds. So for this, uh, we, we have, a, we basically we think tau is one and t zero is 10. So that's the values given to you. And then uh, we want to know the third coefficient. So we want C, K, C3 is what we want over here. Um, and uh, okay, so the, Third coefficient is the value taken by x omega. So x omega at the value omega. So we want basically, let me just write this down and then explain. So we have uh, x omega equals uh, tau omega naught by two pi. Uh, and this is going to be sine uh, omega tau by two over omega tau by two. That's a sink function. And that's from equation, uh, Five thirty-six. Uh, so, and we we are given that we want we want basically omega equals three omega naught, the, th the third harmonic, and uh, omega naught is given by two pi by ten, two pi by t zero, which is two pi by ten, and that's going to be uh, uh, sorry, 
three times, yeah, so three, so which means that uh, three omega naught is going to be six pi by 10, which is uh, 0 0.6 pi. So that's the frequency you're looking at over here. Uh, and so the, if you plug in this value over here of omega, then you're going to get uh, basically, uh, so this value over here, tau omega naught by two pi is, uh, is just one over 10. So tau omega two, this is just one over t naught actually, because tau is one, one over t naught. So this is going to be one over 10 and sine of uh, over here is going to be 0 0.3 pi, because it's, uh, it's omega tau by two over 0 0.3 pi. And if I got my math right, this is 0 0.085. Sorry, not 0 0.0085, but 0 0.085. So hopefully that matches what you got as well. And, and so what you're saying over here that this is sort of the energy at that frequency, at that uh, at the third harmonic, this particular, the, the pulse has energy of uh, 0 0.085, or if you were to draw out the, the sync function, which is sort of this uh, roughly looks like that, you get that. So we're saying that uh, at the third value over here, uh, we're going to get the frequency of, uh, at three to pi at, at, at uh, 0.085 is what you're gonna get over here for, for this particular pulse. You know, it's not a general thing for, for T, for tau equals one and T naught equals 10, this is what you're gonna get over here, that's the amplitude. Okay, uh, any, any questions about that? Uh, yeah, so in this case, the, we don't, we can just assume that the height of the pulse is one. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, the, it, okay. I, should, I, should, I should have said it's a unit pulse. I mean, if I, if I didn't state it's a unit pulse, then I should have stated that that would be a mistake. Right. Uh, yeah, sorry. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure it's a real periodic, yeah, it should be a unit periodic, sorry. Yeah, you can assume that it's, you know, but otherwise, if you can assume it's of any height, then that would be the multiplying by that, that height over there. Okay, so moving on to, Oh, sorry, to 13 now. All right, so we're gonna compute the Fourier transform and uh, of this, uh, uh, of the single left triangular pulse divided. So this is what it is. It's the uh, left triangular pulse given by, oh, sorry, not this way, oops. It's the uh, one minus T, one minus T in the range zero one. Zero one. Okay, and so we don't have a repeating thing anymore. We just have this uh, pulse over here, and uh, so to compute the uh, the Fourier transform of this, we just go to the equation over here, which is integral. So the transform is going to be integral zero to one, uh, one minus t. That's x of t e to the minus j omega t dt. And we just need to do zero to one because it's zero everywhere else. And then this uh, is just expanding this out over here. It's going to be integral zero to one e to the minus j omega t dt minus uh, integral zero to one t e to the minus j omega t dt. And so the first one is just going to be uh, this one over here. That's just um, e to the minus j omega t over minus j omega evaluated at one and zero. And then the second one is going to be uh, minus j omega t e to the minus j omega t minus e to the minus j omega t over omega squared evaluated at one and zero again. And then uh, if we can simplify this as, as b to the e to the minus j omega minus one over minus j omega plus uh, minus j omega e to the minus j omega over omega squared. So that is, that is what you're looking for, essentially as a transform. 
So when you get these oddball things like this, uh, you know, the, the transform doesn't look very pretty. I mean, that's another way of putting it, but you can't find it, but it doesn't look pretty. Okay, uh, and any questions about that? Um, why do we denote the Fourier transform as a function of J omega and not just omega? Yeah, so the, the I mean, the notation differs for, you know, depend, depending on where you look. And uh, for the, the uh, easiest way to think about it is that the J omega is a, is a reminder that this is not a, uh, this is a, sort of the, the frequency is a complex value here. We are going into the, uh, maybe the easiest way to explain it is when you do the Laplace transform, we'll be looking at uh, uh, the pre-multiplication or the multiplication of the function. So let, let me explain uh, just a little bit and just kind of go into the theory of things just for a moment. Um, when you do the Fourier transform, what you, what you can think of is, uh, one way to think of it is that we are writing down the, um, the, the following uh, function. We're computing the following function. We're saying that we are computing, um, sorry, just let me make sure I the, the right thing over here. So the, if you're saying that X of what is J omega is given by integral minus infinity to infinity, X T, e to the minus j omega t dt. So if I split it up into components, that's the function over here. And what I'm doing is I'm multiplying it by this value over here, e to the minus j omega t dt, right? When you do the uh, Laplace transform, what we do is we're going to keep x t over here and you're going to replace this one by uh, e to the uh, sigma uh, sigma plus j omega, let's just ignore the minus for now, sigma plus j omega dt, right? And we call this as s. Okay, we call it e to the s t dt, where s is a complex number, okay? So uh, when you write a complex number s, we have the sigma and j omega. So the j omega and the Fourier transform is used by some authors, some mathematicians, whatever, to remind you that this is a value of S, which is a complex value. It's not in the real plane, it's in the complex, it's in the complex, uh, it's, it's in the, it's in the complex side. So, so the uh, notation J omega is uh, in some sense, just a reminder of that, but it becomes very clear when you go into uh, Laplace, why we write, we're keeping the reminder because we will be, then view the Fourier transform as the special case of the Laplace transform as S equals zero plus J omega, where we, we re removed the, uh, uh, where we removed the uh, real value altogether. And so that's the, or zero minus J omega to be more precise, I guess. But that's, that's, that's the uh, value of S that we're using for the Fourier transform. So that reinforces the view of the Fourier transform as being a special case of the Laplace transform. Right. And again, the, yeah, so the, again, the, the whole kind of pedagogy over here is to think of the, I mean, the whole problem is we have these functions which are, which are not, you know, which are not integrable, right? They, they integrate, they integri, sorry, the value of the function in integrated from minus infinity to infinity is infinite. So what do we do? We're going to have to squish it down. Right, we're going to squish it down by multiplying it with a really fast declining function, which is e to the minus s. Right, and that's how we get the Laplace transform of functions that would not normally have a Fourier transform. So that was the idea from Laplace from it. Let's squish it down by multiplying it with some value where sigma is pretty large. You know, if sigma is large enough, and that's what's called the domain of validity, then the function is going to be small enough, and then the integral value exists. And so uh, the Fourier can then be viewed as a special case where we're not squishing it down, we're letting it be as it is, and uh, we're just going to look at the JMN. Okay. All right, so moving on to 14 then. Um, but that's a good question, I mean, yeah. Okay, so we're going to compute the in inverse Fourier transform of, of this value over here by it's got two deltas in it, delta omega plus omega naught plus delta omega minus omega naught 
uh, from, from first principles, you only compute the inverse transform of this. And so to do this, we basically plug in the value, um, the, the property, the formula for the inverse transform. And so this is going to be given by uh, X of T is going to be given by uh, one over two pi um, integral minus infinity to infinity by uh, no, sorry, delta omega plus, oops, omega plus omega naught uh, plus uh, delta omega minus omega naught e to the j omega t d omega. All right, now, uh, so we'll make this, so we'll, the, the pi's cancel out as it comes to one over two integral minus infinity to infinity, uh, delta omega plus omega naught uh, e to the j omega t d omega plus uh, one over two integral plus infinity to infinity delta omega minus omega naught e to the j omega t, t omega. Okay, so these look like pretty complicated. Uh, okay, thanks, Yula. Uh, so these uh, look pretty complicated, but it turns out that uh, this, there's something called the sifting property. And the sifting property basically says that, uh, and that's equation of 515, and uh, which, which basically says that x of t uh, in integral uh, x, sorry, so let me be very clear here. Uh, I'm just going to write down exactly what's there so I'm not making a mistake. Um, what it says is that uh, x of tau equals integral minus infinity to infinity xt uh, delta t minus tau dt. And so, uh, if you look at these equations over here, um, this is sort of x of t because a function of t over here, it's x of t. And tau is being replaced uh, over here. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, right. So the, by, by uh, omega naught. And what, what you can rewrite this equation as is being just uh, e to the j omega naught uh, uh, t. And then from the same sifting property, we get e to the minus j omega naught t. And so we're going to get this plus this over two, which is basically cos omega t. And so, so the, the, uh, the idea here is to essentially use the property of the uh, delta function. Uh, and, and the way to think about it is something like this. The, the delta function just is selecting out the value at this, at this omega naught value over here. And here it's selling out the value at minus omega naught over here. And so we get these two, we get these two over here. And so we get cos. And so that's why it cos has this really funny transform of, of pi uh, times delta omega omega naught and delta minus. And these are sort of in the omega domain, these are impulses at plus and minus omega naught. If you have this as not as time, but it's omega and it's minus omega naught. And these are impulses at omega naught and minus omega naught. Okay, and then for the last one, since you're running on slow on time, I'm just going to jump ahead. Uh, the last one, we are basically computing. So we, here it's just a matter of plugging in the values from the table and noticing that uh, when you have a time shift, you get a multiplication by e to the omega naught. So when you go sort of t minus t naught, this results in the multiplication by e to the minus j omega, j omega uh, t naught. And so the, so the, by just sort of plugging it in, we get this fairly complicated looking thing, which is, uh, so this is pi uh, delta omega plus omega naught plus delta omega minus omega naught. So this is basically saying I have two pulses and I'm going to multiply that 
by uh, e to the j omega t naught because I'm time shifting it. And then plus I have the other value over here for the sinusoidal, which has a different value. So it's j pi uh, delta omega, oops. J pi delta of omega minus omega naught minus delta of omega minus omega naught uh, e to the minus j omega t naught. So it's just doing time shifting and uh, linearity, which gives us this ugly expression, but oh, there you go. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, we're a bit late. Uh, that's mainly because I messed up on the first one. But any questions about this? Are you allowed to consider sign as a time shifted cause? Uh, sure, it's another way to do it. Time shift, I mean, the sign is a, it's shift time shifted by pi by two. Yeah. Uh, you can do it that way too, yes. But the expressions in the end should be equivalent. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, great. Well, uh, I will be having office hours on Thursday. So if you have any other questions, you know, uh, best to come to that or to send me mail and I'll try and answer it best I can. And again, uh, my apologies for the, <laughs> for the mistake with the first one. And uh, my only excuse is that I never really like, uh, <laughs> I never really like converting from angular radiance to real, real frequencies. So. But anyway, um, that's, that's not a good excuse, but sorry about that. And thank you for your help. Okay, great. So uh, I will see some of you then on Thursday and uh, yeah, we'll continue with this. So this particular, we're kind of picking up speed. So the next time you know, it's going to be going to focus more on Laplace and then we'll finally go into control theory at least basic parts of control theory and then simulation. So we, we, we have, uh, a little bit more to go and but it'll be going at a bit faster rate uh, from now on. okay thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Okay, bye bye